Let us pray. O God of love, plant us in the soil of your grace. Nurture us with the strength of Christ, the vine of everlasting life. Enlighten us with the wisdom of your spirit, which flows through us today and all days. Abide in us, that we may abide in you and live in your love. As we gather here as a people of God, we pray that our worship will reflect that divine love. We offer our worship today with the remembrance of Easter, still filling us with joy, and with the anticipation of Pentecost firing our devotion. Let our praise for all that God has done, is doing, and will do truly resound within our hearts and our homes, within these walls and beyond. In your holy name we pray, echoing the words your son taught us so long ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. You may be seated as our children come forward at this time for our children's sermon. Good morning. Good morning. Not bad for the sides, but I think you guys can be louder. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Can I get good morning kids from you guys? Good morning. All right. So I got a question for you. Come on. Come on. So I got a question for you guys. Have you guys ever been afraid? You can admit, yes. You guys have been afraid? Does this help? Have you guys ever been afraid? Raise your hand. Okay, see, they've all been afraid. So have you guys ever been afraid? Yeah, see? Okay. Is it fun to be afraid? No, it doesn't feel very good, is it? Now, we're afraid of all kinds of different things, right? Let's see. Um, you guys participate in this as well, so you guys put it up your hands. Um, if you're afraid of spiders, raise your hand. Me. Yeah. Um, heights? Um, let's see, uh, clowns? That's good. Good to be honest about it. Being afraid isn't fun, and, and yet we're afraid of all kinds of things. Well, the scripture for today, we're talking about fear and love. Is it better, would you think it's better to love than fear? Yeah, it feels a lot better. Well, fortunately, God wants us to love more than we're afraid. God wants us to love one another and not be afraid of one another. Because in sharing God's love, and sharing the, the love that God gives to us, we share it out. And it grows and grows and grows and multiplies. And it erases all fear. Because you can't be afraid of the things you love. 
Now, does anybody now feel like they love spiders? That's okay. It's a work in progress. You're afraid of the dark. Okay, let's do that one. Who's afraid of the dark? Yeah, good. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and gathering us here together safely to learn about you. Lord, we thank you for your love, which is so much more powerful than all the things we fear. And we know that you will keep us safe and protected in your world. Lord, help us to spread that love you have for us. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture reading today comes from the book of 1 John, chapters 4, verses 7 through 21. It can be found on page 241 of the New Testament in your pew Bibles. Here begins the reading. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we may live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he is in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not received perfection and love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Love, 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 love. 26 times. Love is in the air. What a refreshing feeling. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Gracious God, may these words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. John is completing this, his point or concluding his teaching on love by this statement. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters because that is the supremest of all commandments and Jesus commanded us to love others. I try to bring this thought into a visual, a diagram or a picture where we could see what it really means. We will try to imagine a diagram in our mind. In verse 4, we see all three of them. First, it's God. Next, as we see in the text, it is addressed to us. So, it's us and the read, as the readers, and the third, is our brothers, our neighbors, or the immediate next person. As we read in the previous verse of this lection or pericope or this portion of the text from the scripture, we learn that John is describing about God's love and also proclaims that God is love. We see a special element in this, love. The text explained to us where this love comes from or the source of it. 
Love, which is the central theme of this text or this passage, originates or starts from God. This is the one, God is the one who loved us at first place. So in our diagram or in our picture, we shall draw a connecting line from God to us and make it an arrow to donate the flow of love, which is from God to us. Now the question we can ask is, how perfect is this love? How this could be? In verse 9, we read that God's love was revealed in this way. God sent God's only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Love is perfected through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In verse 10, we read that in this love, not that we loved God, that He loved us. This verse talks directly to us about the default setup that we have to love God. John talks about, talks about our love towards God. The love that came from God is sent back by us to God because it was perfected through Jesus Christ. Now we'll make another line from us to God. Now the flow of the love is both ways. It resembles a small circuit. The flow of love is from God and from us to God. If you read this text from the other's perspective, from our neighbor's perspective, everything that happens to us is reflected or duplicated to the others. So we duplicate the connecting lines or the flow of love from God to the others and others to God. John also writes that we have to love our brothers and sisters because God loved us. And those who love God must love their brothers and sisters. This command is repeated again and again because there is a supposition in it. It is repeated three times in verse 7, 11, and 12. John is, John is pointing us to a very important thing by repeating this phrase, love one another. Since this love for others comes from the perfected love of God, we have to reflect the same love to others. So here too, we will duplicate the flow of lines from us to others and others to us, which is perfected by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What do we see now? We see a complicated but a perfect circuit, a perfect uninterrupted flow of love. In verse 11 we read, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, which means God is revealed through us to others. John writes that if we love one another, we might see God in each of us who is living within us. So God loves us and God is seen in us and when we love others, it gets perfected. It can also be said that the circuit of God's love gets complete or it becomes whole in its full sense only when we extend ourselves to love others. The completion of the whole love story of the scripture happens or realized only if we love our neighbors. The next thing that attracted me in the lection is the mention of the day of judgment. John writes that those who love their neighbors need not be worried about the judgment that is to be proclaimed on, proclaimed on them on the day of judgment. The love that we humans directed towards God and others, the love that we reflected on others is the love that we received from God, the one who first loved us. 
Further, we embodied the love of God, and now we reflect it on others. Now, John writes that this act of showing love to others gives us the confidence and courage to face the day of judgment. In verse 18, we read that there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. There are many ways that this fear could be interpreted. But we will try to grasp it in a way that it will enhance our understanding of love. John talks about confidence. What is confidence? Confidence, in a way, can be explained as a state of mind when which fear is absent. It also means that if we love God, there is no fear. Fear of what? The answer that we get from this text is fear of punishment. We understand that fear is closely related to punishment. Judgment and punishment, confidence and fear are closely related to each other and are of the same jargon. Before we try to delve deep into the understanding of what kind of fear that John mentions, let us look at what fear in religious term means. Fear could be defined as an emotional forbidding or dread of impeding distress or misfortune often spoken of as the cause of people wanting religion. Yet, fear alone can never account for true religion, since men are impelled to draw near to God, the object of their worship. One does not desire to come close to being that one fears. One will never want to be close to anyone whom he or she fears. Fear should not fuel our love for God. In true love for God, there shall be no fear. If we simplify it in a way, the object of love, which is God, shall not stimulate a fear that is directed on the one who loves God. The one who is in love need not love in fear or out of fear. Fear is present then love becomes a stunt. It becomes a staged one. If there is fear in love, it becomes a quasi-love. Fear cancels love on both sides. Fear cancels true love on the one who is loved or the one who loves. Now when we look at this diagram, the flow of love among the three is perfect. There is no fear in it. If there is a fear element present at any point, it cancels the love. The love circuit is broken and the realization of this love story is canceled. Fear cancels the good news that we preach and practice. Fear is the circuit breaker. It breaks the flow of love, which is the good news for this world. We are commissioned to be carriers, transformers, and regulators in, of, the, of love without fear for each other and without the fear of the day of judgment. I would like to tell you a story. deserves to be recorded as a history. It was a cold January night. Thousands were returning home as the jungle camp ended in which the gospel was preached. There were many who heard the good news for the first time. Most of them received health care for the first time. The missionary family of five, father, mother, 
daughter and two teenage sons along with the volunteers were so happy that they were able to share the love of God with those who were deprived and exploited by the educated affluent and the malfunctioning bureaucracy. The missionary couple decided to split the family that night. The father let, left the mother and the daughter in the campsite and he and his boys left to base camp. On the way back in the middle of the night, the father pulled over the old village wagon into one of the tribal villages where he provides health care. He parked the vehicle next to his clinic and turned back to see the boys cuddled together deep in sleep. He made himself comfortable in the front seat. The dad could not sleep. Something was disturbing his mind and he was feeling a sense of discomfort in his heart. The camp was a grand success. The good news was preached and many were given health care, medicines were distributed, food was provided to all and every soul went home happily. Feeling the love of God that was passed on to them by this family, each and every person were blessed. It has been 16 years that he had come to this land where his presence was needed. With that feeling of great joy of sharing God's love, he slowly drifted into sleep. The next day back in the jungle camp, someone came running to the mother and whispered something in her ears, which shocked her. She took her daughter and some helpers and rushed to the village where her husband and her boy stopped for the night. As she entered there, there was a strange feeling. She felt something strange in the air. The crowd parted. And she saw this. A burnt wagon with three charred bodies embracing each other. Later during the investigation, it was said that the mob of religious terror group came in and attacked the missionary and his sons, burned them alive along with the vehicle. No one knows how they did this. No one was willing to describe that happened that night. Whatever that happened, the kids might have tried to escape and the dad surely might have tried to save them. One can only imagine how it might have been on that moment when this happened, the scream, the cry. No soul was there to witness other than the terror mob. The national news headlines was Australian missionary Graham Steins and his two teenage sons were murdered by a terror mob. To make the long story short, the culprits were captured and the Supreme Court passed the judgment, death sentence for the mastermind. Graham's wife, Gladys, released a statement which shocked the whole nation. She said that she has forgiven those who killed her family and will continue to share God's love. She said that she will continue to love without fear. Continue to do what they were doing in that country without fear. She never let this go beyond her limits. As a foreign national, she had all the privilege, all the privilege to create a sensation among different nations but the fearless continuation of her missionary work perfected the love she had for the people of that country. And she continued without creating any hype over the death of her family. Jesus feared for his death. 
he cried to his father. His capillaries burst and blood oozes, oozed out through his forehead. But he gave up. He gave up that fear because he loved us. The love for us encouraged him. He gave up to perfect God's love. Fear begets doubt. Fear begets anger. Fear begets hate. And fear destroys relationships. Fear cancels love. If we fear God, we cannot love God. If we fear our partner, we cannot love. If we fear our neighbor, we cannot love. If we fear this world, we cannot love. When fear interferes the circuit of love, it cancels the flow of love. Friends, We are here to love because God loved us first. And that love should be passed on to others. And in the passing and receiving, fear should not be there. Fear should not interfere because fear cancels the flow of love. Fear in any form cancels perfect love. Amen. Amen. <coughs> if there is anyone who would like to come and plug into this circuit of love, is there anyone if you would like to reaffirm your relationship with Jesus Christ? You are welcome as we sing the hymn of, hymn of Christian life, invitation to Christian life. You may be seated. Wonderful job, Charles. So proud of the word that you brought to us today and the way that it was delivered and a reminder of that love that conquers all. And that's what we bring to our time of prayer today. Ways to keep the flow of love going between ourselves and others, and especially between our God and the world. 
Today, as we enter into this prayer time, a few uh, joys to lift up and celebrate. Right next to me is this lovely red rose that is in honor of Sian and Dan Ishihara, who had little baby Lani, L-A-N-I, this past week. The baby, Lonnie, was born at 7 pounds and 14 ounces, and everybody is healthy and well. So we celebrate with Sion and with Dan. We also lift up with Thanksgiving. I see my friend Teresa Krim back there. Teresa um, had the honor of being mother of the groom last week at the wedding of her son, Zach, to Evie Crab. Um, and it was a beautiful wedding and continued prayers for the happy couple and for the parents of both bride and groom and grandparents also, of course. And then just seated a little off to the right of Teresa, we, we also celebrated a couple last week, Buck and Jackie, newly engaged. So congratulations to the two of you. Yeah, let's give them all a hand. This is exciting. This is really where we do see that love at work and moving and growing in our world. God is good and continues to love amongst us. And one of the ways that we in this church have um, focused in a way of tangibly sharing God's love is through a very particular ministry, our prayer shawl ministry. I'd like to invite Elaine Burkett, if you would, come forward at this time and share what it is that this group does. And I'm going to invite people later to come up, but if you'll um, speak to Today is the National Day of Prayer, and the Prayer Shell Ministry has gone outside the church to expand to other areas of our community. We make prayer shawls for the sick, baby blankets for newborns in our church, and to uh, the newborns at Parkland Hospital. We make caps for the homeless and the shut-ins, lap robes for shut-ins and for their birthdays and for the veterans. We also made Christmas stockings and ornaments for the shut-ins. We also make um, pockets for walkers and wheelchairs for Fowler and the veterans. And today we will pray over our prayer shawls, our baby blankets, and lap robes and pockets. At this time of year, every year, we um, all have the opportunity to lay our hands on the prayer shawls, and I invite all who are able, if you would come up at this time and gather around the table's choir, you have the prayer shawls laid out in front of you, and let us gather together with our prayers. We don't know where these shawls, these lap robes, these baby blankets will be going, but we know that when they go to the right person, that they will carry our prayers. So come forward at this time, all who are able. And if you are not able to um, be right up near a shawl, if you'd like to come on the chancel area up by me, there's plenty of room. Sure, come on up. Yes. Let us bow our heads in prayer. The power of your love flows through us, almighty God. The power of your healing love is embedded within each strand of yarn, 
each loving prayer that went into each one of these pieces of beauty, signs of love, symbols of hope. We pray, Almighty God, that those who are broken, who are struggling with sickness of body and maybe even of spirit, those who lift up prayers of thanksgiving and joy at new life with babe in arm, and those who are just trying to stay warm in the winter, that with each item upon which our hands lay, upon which all of our prayers lay, that those who receive will feel your presence, will feel that hope in new life, will feel you, Almighty God. This is our prayer this day. All praise, glory, thanksgiving in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You all may be seated. Everyone is moving back to their seats. I invite us now um, to our deacons and elders, if you would please move. And I invite us to look at how it is that we have just given our prayers to show our love. Let us continue to look at other tangible ways that we might use our time to share our love. You'll see all the upcoming events in your bulletin. And just a reminder to make sure if you're on any committees, just to check out the opportunities page at East Dallas this week. Oh, uh, just a heads up that um, next week, uh, Mother's Day is Sunday. And in your, um, in your bulletin, there are things that are forthcoming that we need to have your um, uh, reservations for. So on the back of the attendance card, please, if you would, fill that, that attendance card out. Let us know, if, especially if there's any change of address or telephone number. If you need the newsletter uh, by email or if you want us to mail it to you, please put that all down on your attendance card. And then on the back of that is that um, name tag and Colin are you available to model again or are you I don't think he's here all right so somewhere find Colin McCraney he's wearing the new model of our name tag please put down the name that you would like to go by uh, this is our next to the last Sunday to collect those we would appreciate you doing so and the other card that pretty picture on that other card is of Miles Ranch and we're once again inviting the whole church to come and spend a retreat day at the Miles Ranch home one uh, Mary Jean's ranch outside of Sulphur Springs it is a a time for folks just to come. We do have a brief time in the Word together. We eat some of the best barbecue I have ever eaten for lunch. Lots of folks go fishing. Lots of folks sit around tables and play Mexican train. Lots of folks just sit on rocking chairs on the back porch and just sit and enjoy God's beautiful creation. Again, this is open to everyone in the church. We would like to have reservations. We need reservations. Um, if you need a ride to the, the place, let us know. We will make sure that there's transportation for those who can't uh, and don't want to drive. But if you want to drive, we'll also get you a map. The time, more or less, is like from 9, 9.30 to 3, 3.30 on that Saturday. Also, Hannah Fisher wants me to remind you that shortly after that is the Youth Bake Off. And this is a fundraiser for the youth for camps and for mission trip. Uh, for those of you who participated last year, we have people in the church make, and we really do want homemade goodies for dessert. Um, and, and we have a, a, a 
contest, competition uh, uh, between those um, who have baked and we find out who makes the best brownies in the church or who makes the best pecan pie in the church. If you would like to bring one of your favorite recipes and enter it in, please see uh, Hannah and or Peggy. And then the youth are also going to be making the rest of us spaghetti for lunch that day. So we'll be looking forward to having lunch together. Those are what's going on in the church. Lots going on. The ways that we show one another love by giving our time. But that's just us. What do we do when we watch television and, our, and the news riles us up and we feel so helpless um, as we watch homes destroyed by earthquakes in Nepal or violence in the streets of Baltimore? This morning, one of the ways that we're going to help conquer fear and keep the love flowing is by taking up a, a special offering. In addition to our usual offering for the ongoing work of the church, we are taking up a special offering today, and we're going to split it in half. Half of the money we raise today will go to our, race, our reconciliation offering, which helps our denomination look at ways that we can combat racism and bring about reconciliation. And then the other half goes to our Week of Compassion offering, which is our arm of the church that helps out in times of disaster and devastation. And we will earmark it for the earthquake in Nepal. So today, let us continue to fight fear and live in our love as we give our tithes and our offerings.
May these gifts, O oh God, wrap around the world, wrap around our communities, wrap around our hearts, filled with love. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. At this table, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and lifting to heaven, he blessed it and broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Take, eat, and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. All are invited to this table. For this is the Lord's table, and this is the table of love and not fear. For here there is nothing to fear. If you live with fear in your heart and in your life, leave it behind. You are freed from it. This table was set by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, a gift of love for his disciples passed down to us here and now. And it is just as real to us today as it was on that night. For this is the Lord's table set by him for you. Come and partake. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to your table to give thanks for the loaf, representing the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. We are deeply grateful and take seriously your call to be the body of Christ in the world today. Help us to reflect your love for us as we love one another. Forgive us when we disappoint and fail you. In Jesus' name, amen. Loving God, our Father, as we taste the wine which represents the blood of Jesus our Christ, teach us to discern his living presence and grant that our praise and worship may be more than empty form. Make us better Christians and strengthen us to choose love over fear. Amen.
Shall we all stand up, please? We've heard the love of God, took part in the love feast of Jesus Christ. And how many of you felt the love of God and Jesus? Raise your hands, please. Can you share it with your neighbors? Can you share it with your neighbors now, to your right or left? Just share your love, the peace, before we leave this place. I want to, before we leave, I want to tell you something. Let us love others and conquer fear. Let us start loving, but be careful. Be aware there are love mongers outside. <laughs> Go in peace and let us sing the Congregational Benediction, hymn number 436. Thank you.